Today it is uh, the 21st of April, 1972. We're in Oklahoma City. The day before the annual Western Heritage Awards program and the annual meeting of the trustees of the National Cowboy Hall of Fame and Western Heritage Center, we're interviewing one of the trustees of the National Cowboy Hall of Fame, Mr. John Baumgartner of San Juan Batista, California, a trustee from the state of California. Uh, making this interview will be Penn Wood and Neil Tui from uh, Oklahoma Christian, uh, working with the Oklahoma Living Legends at Oklahoma Christian College. And Mr. Baumgartner, we're going to let you take over pretty quick. And we're going to ask you if you will tell us your uh, background, where, who your parents were, your mother's maiden name and father, where they came from, and where you grow, grew up. Well, um, we have to go back perhaps to the history of, of my grandfather going to California in, uh, in 49 to San Francisco. He was educated at his home. He was a young man of 18 years of age at that time, coming from Boston to California. He, uh, his father was in the butcher business in Boston, and he became in the butcher business in San Francisco because he, his idea of the mines in those years were that out of a thousand people that went to the mines, maybe 20 people were successful and the rest didn't make it. So he went into the butcher business in San Francisco, supplying the mines with beef as well as the ships coming into San sailing vessels. Later on, excuse me, later on he retired in, in 1868, he retired, and uh, Mr. Flood of the then uh, Nevada Bank, the San Francisco, now the Wells Fargo Bank, asked him to go to Imperial, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, San Joaquin Valley to look over a ranch, which he did, and uh, took over the management of that ranch. He always wanted to be a cattleman, and uh, uh, later on sold to John Clay of the later John Clay, or the present John Clay Commission, the uh, Livestock Commission Company of Chicago, and who wrote a book entitled My Life on the Range. And in this book, he describes all of the various people that he met and describes their, uh, the type of people they were and so forth. And, they, and he and my grandfather went to Southern California to purchase a ranch, and John Clay's people who put up the money at that time uh, uh, did not, could not put up the money, and so my grandfather then later bought it with Mr. Flood, what is now Camp Pendleton, the Santa Margarita Ranch. And there is where I was raised uh, early because I uh, uh, lived there on the ranch with my grandparents and my uncle, and my mother and father at times, but my father was a contractor, in, I mean a, uh, an architect in San Francisco. And later on, when I got to the age of nine years of age, why well, I who thought it was plenty of time for me to go to school. And uh, under my grandfather's ideas, San Francisco was the only city on the Pacific Coast that had the cultural institutions and so forth there, so they sent me to San Francisco to school, together with uh, my brothers and my sister. But all of the years I was in school in, uni in, uh, in San Francisco, at the University of California in those days, we call it the Cow College of Davis. Um, I spent all of the vacations on the old ranch, the old Santa Margarita. And this way I learned the cattle business, of course, and the vaquero business, and everything that has to do with the operations of a cattle ranch in California. And uh, this has been the story of the beginning of my career. Why don't you tell a little bit about uh, life on the ranch during this uh, early day and uh, earlier day when you were there, and uh, what it was like, and think of any particular experiences that might be of interest uh, uh, at that time. Well, I, I, I could say this, at least I believe, that I fortunately was in that period of California history when in, in certain respects with regard to the ranches, the vaqueros and the operation of those ranches, it was that period between the American and the Spanish period of California because on this ranch in Southern California, all of the vaqueros there were either Indians from the reservation there or Californios from San Juan Capistrano 
or a few from Baja California, and all of the people taking care of the, uh, the, uh, the production of grains and hay on the properties, they were mostly all of them were from Baja California and Mexico. And in this respect, this is the way I had my beginning as a cowman and a cowboy, or a vaquero. And it was rather interesting because things have changed greatly since that time in the business. And in those days, it was entirely, uh, not entirely, but pretty much different than it is today. There were no contests. There were no rodeos or rodeos, as we call them in California. Uh, none of this type of thing. It was just play and work or board a horse all the time. And everything was with a, on that ranch. Everything was either rawhide, buckskin, uh, to put their saddles together, and hair, of course, in the winter times, they made buck, they made the uh, 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 riatas and hair ropes uh, for the use on the ranch. And this is the way it was. And uh, everyone was known by my grandfather and my uncle as Mr. So and So. No one was called by their first name. They could have been a just a, a, a vaquero or a young young man. Of course, they called by the first name, but the rest of them was Mr. So and So. And this is the way it would operate over those years, and many, many years, up to oh, the, almost the death of my uncle in 1926. It was operate, operated almost the same way by the vaqueros from San Juan Capistrano, from Pala Indian Reservation, and from Baja California. How was your relationship in working with him? How did you find him as workers? Oh, in those days, of course, they were the finest. We, I thought, as growing up with them, uh, uh, this is from whom I learned, and uh, uh, they were, there wasn't any question about, they were the great, great uh, vaqueros, or cowmen as they call them, and uh, you know, they handled a the situation there which was different in those days, of course. The numbers of cattle produced, they had to get three packers to come in there and buy the cattle, of course one couldn't handle that many cattle at a time in those days in Southern California, and so there were three uh, uh, companies that would come in and buy those cattle at the same time and shipped by railroads. There were no trucks in those days. The, what, what were the years that you were working there? In those well, I was, I was uh, there up till uh, uh, 1911 as a, just a youngster. Uh, and then all vacations after that, and upon graduation from the university uh, in those days, we call it the Cow College, uh, in 1925, I was down there working the slaughterhouse in San Diego and the Santa Margarita Ranch for two years and decided that I should go into business for myself, and that's when I started in business myself. Tell about the slaughterhouses, how they, the difference in the slaughterhouse when you worked there and uh, how they operate now. Well, of course, there was not the demands by the federal government and others uh, with regard to those slaughterhouses in those days. Uh, most of it was done uh, by uh, the, the butchers themselves. They didn't have the machinery in those days to handle the beef as they do today, nor did they have the, the uh, uh, equipment to freeze or to put the cattle in, uh, 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 the in into the, uh, 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 excuse me, can you stop that when I move yeah. back? Well, in those days, the, the, uh, they didn't have the coolers as we have them today in the, in the uh, uh, packing houses and slaughterhouses, and didn't have the equipment, as I said before. But uh, the results are similar. We didn't have the grading of the beef in those days. Uh, the beef was, was uh, slaughtered, and most of it was, uh, all of it, matter of fact, was uh, grass-fed beef. We didn't have what in those later on in those days they called the uh, uh, the uh, uh, fed beef, Kansas City fed beef, and this type of thing uh, in California. Everything was grass-fed, and it was back in about 1925 and 1926 when the feedlot started in California and built a feedlot on the ranch there, and these other big uh, people in Southern California put in the feedlots. And this is a great difference in, in the quality of beef that we have today. But talk, oh, yes, go ahead. I want to talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned going into your own business. Uh, why don't we talk about your moving into your own adult career? Well, 
Uh, yes, in 1927, 28, I uh, decided that I should be in the business, and I was uh, uh, encouraged to go in business for myself. And I tried to rent a ranch all the way from Mexican border and get up as far as, uh, as San Benito County, which is a central, uh, central coast county, one of the central coast counties of California, uh, adjacent to Monterey County, Santa Clara County, and uh, uh, rented a ranch there and went into business for myself, 1927. And uh, I've been, I've had cattle there ever since that time. However, uh, during the, uh, in 19, 1941, the old ranch there, uh, uh, my uncle was gone, and a decision was made between the Fudd family and our family. The place would be divided up because there were uh, quite a number of heirs, and it should be divided up uh, uh, so that in the future each family would have their own property and continue with this. Well, as far as our s part of the ranch was concerned, which was a central, a large central part of the ranch, it was pretty rough country, and we were younger then than the other members of the family, so we took the roughest part of it along the coast there, California. And uh, uh, we finished building some fences and, and rebranding the cattle and dividing up many, much of the property. In, uh, uh, by the end of 19, uh, 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 no, by February 1942. Of course, our war started in, in December the 7th of 41. By 1942, they had to have places to drill the Marines, and so they moved in and took the ranch by condemnation. They took uh, two thirds of the ranch up to the San Clara, I mean, the, excuse me, the San Diego and uh, Orange County line. Everything in San Diego County, the Navy took, and what was left in the north part went to my uncle and my cousins who own it today. And that was known, that is known as uh, the uh, Rishu Vieja Ranch, where the whole property is known as the Santa Margarita, and is now Camp Pendleton. And is, uh, is all of Camp Pendleton on what was once the ranch? All, all of Camp Pendleton is. They took about 240,000 acres. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, I'm uh, 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 140,000 acres that they have there. It's all in, San, in, in uh, San Diego County. Do you still operate the other portion? No, no, that's my cousin's. Your cousin's have that. Yes. So yeah. what did you do at that point? Well, I, then I, I expanded somewhat in, San, in, uh, in uh, Northern California, or Central California, rather, and uh, have been continuing this operation. We still are, I still am, rather, and uh, uh, in Santa Clara, in, in Santa Clara and San Benito counties, and also uh, with 250 pairs up in Oregon in the summer, in the winter time, during this season. Excuse me, in the summer, from uh, the first of May to the first of November, we're up there in mm -hmm. southern Oregon with cattle. But this has been that uh, mixed up in all these other sure. things. Well, uh, the, uh, we're, we're not so con concerned with you about you know perfection on the energy on the tape because the, this this provides the information and the voice. Oh, I see. Uh, so oh. we don't have we don't have to worry about. In other words, oh. this is not something. That oh, this is all right then. Sure, sure. On their yes, and we and we cut out all of this. Oh, yes. Um, the um, thinking in terms of uh, of ranching today. You, you were in it back before the 20s, and you were, you're in it today. Uh, why don't we make some comparisons there of uh, uh, both the technique, the people involved, what the type of people involved, what uh, the skills required, and how many it takes to operate uh, today compared with uh, before Little Nevada? Well, there's been, of course, great changes in the development of the present procedure of ranch management. Uh, in the handling of cattle, particularly today, we have the feedlots, we have the production of various 
supplemental seeds that in those days we had little or nothing of. We had some cottonseed cake, and that was about it. And uh, But today you have all of these other supplemental seeds, and you have the But it's true, uh, veterinary science has built up greatly in the, in the uh, determination of what can or cannot be fed to cattle and how to preserve the, the, uh, uh, the cattle development and the growth of the calves and this type of thing that in those days we had little information on. In, in those days, as far as disease was concerned in cattle, there were two or three things that we understood, the rest we didn't understand. And uh, furthermore, we didn't take care of these cattle as well as we do today. We don't feed them. As a matter of fact, the cattle weren't worth as much money today, both from the standpoint of, of uh, income and the other point of taxation in those days. And therefore, we ran lots of cattle, like on the old Santa Margarita with 27,000 head of cattle there all the time. And, uh, uh, but uh, today, because of the farming and so forth, they, they can't run as much, and they won't run as much. But uh, uh, there have been some changes. The number of help in those days, most of the work was done horseback and uh, manually. Today you have all sorts of uh, corrals, chutes, uh, uh, and operations to work with taking care of these cattle, branding them, vaccinating them, to put them through this whole thing. And uh, we have more diseases today in cattle than we ever had in those days, and therefore we have more vaccination uh, to, uh, to accomplish the same thing. And therefore, uh, there are changes made. We don't have vaqueros today like we had in those days, or even cowboys today as we had in those days. When we today, the cowboy is pretty much the boy who uh, ropes on Sunday, and, and these uh, profes professional cowboys or bronc riders and bulldog, uh, 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 those folks that, I mean, those young men, they're athletes today. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they have made quite a position of, their, of themselves, and it's interesting and wonderful, but when it comes to taking care of cattle, it's something different. So we do have a few in help, and we don't need so much in help anymore. We use the corrals, we use the trucks. We don't drive cattle the uh, distance that we used to. The truck places, the railroads in California, Southern Pacific are out, out, of, out of the cattle hauling business. They don't want to do that. So it's the trucking people who have taken over. And the same way with working the horses. Years ago, we'd have to ride, oh, maybe 10 miles before we started to work cattle. Took a lot of hours to do it, but we did it. Today, the horses are put in a trailer and, and uh, uh, Es escorted from from the ranch, from your headquarters out to where the cattle are, and you work the cattle and then put load them up in the trailer and take them back again. So there's just lots of differences. I know in the poultry industry, and I'm sure others, uh, I'm sure that to a certain extent this is true in the cattle industry, uh, uh, it is, uh, has become so scientific that in the poultry industry they, uh, they, they know that, that, that they they can they can predict day by day exactly when when the uh, chicks will be born and when they will go to the market and this is actually scheduled in the market before chicks are born. To what extent is this also true in the cattle industry, or is it at all? Well, it is definitely more true than it used to be. However, it isn't quite uh, as the as the poultry industry is. Of course, they can they can control. Uh, 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 the poultry, because it's only a matter of months or days with poultry, where it's years with cattle, and and, and therefore it is quite a, quite a difference between the two, and of course, as you well know, in the poultry business, uh, things are done in uh, in, uh, in respect where the poultry not even out, out on the ground on the land anymore; they're in cage type of thing, completely controlled uh, by uh, electricity, by water this type of thing, which in the cattle business we don't have quite that, but you do in the feedlots in the various parts of the country you have changes. In Imperial Valley, for instance, uh, where the heat is very great day and night in the summer times, uh, certain breeds of cattle will not 
withstand that heat as well as other breeds. Uh, but after when this was discovered, then they started putting in uh, coolers to cool the water for the cattle to drink and shades for them to get under in the sun during the daytime. And this has changed things a little bit there. And so this is going on more and more all the time, as well as the uh, the, uh, uh, the handling of the cattle in the in the in the feedlots and the, and the slaughterhouses. It's changed uh, greatly, and of course there's more emphasis on the quality of of meat today. And under government grading, you have your choice grades that most popular by most of the big supermarkets. Uh, they go to the choice cattle, and out when you get, I imagine, east of this point, uh, you get the prime cattle, and even this, I think, is losing ground, the prime, <coughs> because of the fat, too much fat, too much waste. And so this is changing very greatly right now in the cattle business to get the same quality of beef without so much fat, because the fat is wasteful today. Years ago, they made, they made uh, uh, candles out of fat, and they made uh, soap out of fat, this type of thing, which they don't use anymore. And therefore, uh, there is a change in the type of animals that we must raise to support what the uh, consumer wants. And uh, uh, of course, today, we hear so much about the cost of beef and so forth, which has nothing to do, actually, with the, the raising of the beef. It's the producing of the, of the retail sale of the beef. And of course, this is another story about why it costs so much money. It isn't the cattlemen that's getting it particularly, but it's uh, the cattleman is only getting today uh, what he got in 1952, but the costs today are three times what they were in 1952 to produce that same amount of beef. What's the name of your ranch? Well, well, where the one you are, well, your operation. Do you have a, sorry, uh, you have several names. Well, the, the we call it uh, the San Justo Ranch at San Juan uh, Bautista in California. It's next to one of the old missions, the close one of the missions. That's where we live, but we lease land uh, all over the county there and up in Santa Clara County and up in Oregon. Have you made uh, in your ranch any innovations that, uh, that may have uh, become an innovation within the industry uh, during think of either during the later periods or during the earlier periods, uh, something that was unique uh, that began to arrange? Not particularly uh, uh, unique. However, working with the University of California uh, Extension Service and others, we did uh, do uh, a good deal of experimentation on the, on the uh, development of feed, local feed, uh, uh, grasses and and uh, legumes on the ranges, and uh, in testing animals of various diseases, trying to find some way of vaccinating uh, uh, against the the disease, and uh, to certain extent successful, but it takes a good many years to develop things of this kind. And I'm sure that as they go on, they're going to develop this thing, and we hope we'll mm -hmm. some method of controlling completely the diseases that we were, talk we were talking about in those days. This may be a hard question just to answer mm -hmm. all, all, off the head, but uh, uh, what experience or, uh, or situation, if you recall, do you think was the most memorable thing in your career for you? The single most memorable, or you may name one or two, you know. I don't know, being raised under the conditions uh, j just grew up uh, uh, with this. But of course, uh, what I learned, of course, at Cal College in those days, Davis, University of California, Davis, uh, 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 naturally, I, I depend a good deal upon. Besides this, in 19... <laughs> 1933, I went broke and uh, um, th those years were pretty hard to get a job. I could get a job as a vaquero almost anywhere, but uh, for $50 a month, uh, it didn't help me very much with a family. So uh, I finally got a job with the University of California in the uh, 
at the uh, extension, farm extension office, and uh, worked with them for three years and went back in the cattle business again. And I, uh, through the, my experience with the university, I did, I learned a lot and, and uh, appreciate the fact that I was accepted there to work with them. And then after that, I got into doing things for the neighbors and before I, were, before I knew it, I was involved in the, in the uh, in establishing a, uh, association, cattle association and saddle horse association and in that part of the country, and then got uh, uh, into the uh, California Cattlemen's Association, became president of that, and then with the American National Cattlemen's Association and all these various groups, and working not only with the university, but with uh, uh, the development of, uh, of uh, the, the problems uh, of, uh, of the handling of, of beef and beef products in the West, and uh, uh, headed a, a committee uh, for a number of years on that, and uh, these things here I became very uh, uh, attracted to, and, uh, and more lately, of course, the Cowboy Hall of Fame, as, as well as other things I'm still connected with in California, but it's plenty of times that I give up some of these mm -hmm. things. And, uh, uh, but it has been enjoyable and beneficial. It's very, I think, very important that today the cattle business isn't only a question of uh, producing these cattle, but the problems concerned as well as the uh, taxation and all of the things. And today we have the, uh, the question of, of how we can dispose of the products, of the uh, Product, product. The, the things produced in a feedlot, for instance, the manures and this type of thing. In California, it's becoming a great, uh, a, a great uh, a problem. Pro a problem, as well as as the air, of course, air pollution, water pollution. All of these things have to do with the production of, of beef, not necessarily on the ranch itself, but even on the ranch. Uh, it's getting so we can hardly burn the brush on the ranch, or uh, things of this kind. And uh, uh, these things will, will be worked out, I'm sure, uh, to the benefit of all of the consumers and everyone. It has to be done, and uh, and it will be done, I'm sure. You weren't the only one who went broke, I'm sure, in 1933. Uh, the, uh, I wonder if you could tell <laughs> a little bit about how you began within the cattle business to make your recovery. You said you went back in about 1933. Yes. Uh, did you did you still have your land then, or had you lost your land when you went? Oh back? no, no, we still had the land, the leases, and this type of thing. But uh, uh, we were able to pay the bank off, and that was about all. So, but there was a, a gentleman came down from San Francisco into that country that wanted in the cattle business, but didn't know very much or practically knew nothing about the cattle business or farming business of this kind, and he asked me to be a partner of his, and I started with him, and after two years we divided the partnership, and I went in from there borrowing money from these same banks that I was able to pay uh, in 1933, and uh, been able to go on since that time, because from that period on, the cattle market got just a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better all along, right through after the war, when we thought things were going to go back after the Second World War, instead of that, they kept going ahead all the time. And so up to oh, about 10 years ago, or, well, 19, no, 20 years ago, things went up, and after that, they started down, and they kept going down to about two years, a year ago, two years ago. You mentioned some of the professional and civic associations. I want to get uh, expand a little bit on that. You mentioned the Saddle Horse Association, I believe, or, uh, why don't you tell about, you, were you involved in the organizing of this? Why don't you tell about the early history of this organization? Well, the one that we established in, in San Benito County, we call it San Benito County Saddle Horse Association, uh, the manager of the fair at that time and the, and the Chamber of Commerce, he'd been up to the Bay Area and saw a horse show up there. And in those days, the most wonderful horse shows, and uh, there were the five-gated, three-gated, and, uh, and the hunters, and all of these horses. And he came back, and this is what he wanted in our county, and he talked to me about it. 
and two or three other people, because I hardly knew anyone in those. I was only in the county two years. And uh, uh, we looked around and decided we couldn't do that. We didn't have that type of horse in the county, enough of them. We had, I don't know, two or three people had some horses like that. So we wanted cow horses, so called. And so established this, uh, similar to the rodeos or rodeos in the country today, uh, especially the uh, track classes, as we call them, that is the cow horse classes, the Hakima horses, and, the, and these horses that work cattle, stock horse cattle. And he gradually developed that, and that was 1929. And uh, we've had a show ever since, excepting a few years during the war, when you couldn't buy gasoline, you, people couldn't get to and from a place. Uh, but we, it's, it's a rather interesting place because it's not, uh, there are no professionals involved. The uh, uh, Cowboy Rodeo Association of Rodeo Association, uh, RCAs, Rodeo the RCAs, uh, uh, they, they can't take part in this thing. It's just local people, local horses, and developed uh, quite a show, and it's been a great thing for the whole area, not only that county, but the other counties around there. And uh, uh, it's been uh, RCAs, the RCAs, uh, uh, they, they can't take part in this thing. It's just local people, local horses, and developed uh, quite a show, and it's been a great thing for the whole area, not only that county, but the other counties around there. And uh, uh, it's been very satisfactory uh, so far as the development of not only of the horses, but of the children and the young people and the families around there. They, uh, they take a great uh, deal of pride in what they're doing there. It isn't a question of winning something because if they don't win, some friend of theirs wins and they think this is great. And it is, it's uh, almost equivalent to, but not quite, to Cow Palace or, or Salinas, California, where they are, knows that type of thing, but smaller. And then the Cattlemen's Association that we became involved in, this was something to work with the university and, and uh, not only leg uh, in the legislature, in the Congress, our congressmen and these people, and with regard to the cattle business in California, in that particular area, and then gradually got into the California Cattlemen Association in that ever since. <coughs> the, uh, why don't you tell a little about how you became involved with the Cowboy Hall of Fame and uh, your participation in that? Uh, you. Well, I, yeah. well, all right, to be honest with you, <laughs> if you want to hear it, I suppose. Well, to be honest with you, uh, uh, I, ca I can't, I don't even remember the year now, but it must have been long, it was about 19, oh, uh, 52, or 53, um, Mr. Reynolds and uh, Ren Farris. Uh, Albert, Albert Mitchell, Mitchell. Uh -huh. Fred Dressler, uh, and Snell, Mr. Snell, and of course uh, uh, Nelson Crow. Uh, oh, we were meeting in Los Angeles. Uh, at that time, they had uh, they, had, they had decided upon this area as being the the area that they wanted to develop the museum in, in the center in. And uh, they were down there. They wanted someone to take over the state of California, and they asked me to come down there. And they talked to me about that. Uh, uh, there were one or two other movie people at that meeting, as I recall. Anyway, uh, at that time, I was worn out. I'd been just retired as president of the California Cattlemen, been going to these meetings, the American National, and these things. I was worn out, and I decided I couldn't handle it at that point. And, uh, and the other thing that bothered me at that time, which has changed since then, uh, was that California had vaqueros. They had the Spanish period of California long before there was a Texan, a Texas, 
or Oklahoma or any other of these states here, the Spanish period there, they had the horses and the cattle, and this was a great period insofar as uh, the, uh, the, uh, this type of thing. And I, at that time, uh, it was right after the, uh, the serious period in central uh, in part of the United States when they had that drought period and so many people just couldn't take it anymore in this part of the country and came to California. They came in so, so many that those Spanish people, they weren't too happy with a lot of this and, uh, and so forth. And I felt that California at that point, at least, uh, you couldn't find enough help there to put up the money to help uh, uh, the uh, Cowboy Hall of Fame. Uh, and so, and I didn't have the time, at least I was tired, I guess, and decided I wouldn't do it. And there was another man in Southern California who had an office, who was one of the largest uh, dairymen, I guess, in the United States. He milked over a thousand head of cows a day, and uh, he had three groups of milkers, and they worked 24 hours a day milking cows. And uh, he said that he, uh, if I would be a, a, a vice chairman, that he would take the chairmanship, uh, which I said, well, all right, and then that's when I got started on the thing, and each time there were others, and I'm not going to mention names, who uh, said that they, that they weren't. They were young people and lots of pep, and I said, well, take my place, take my place, and they did. But, geez, they didn't last six months, and they uh -huh. gave it up. And uh, uh, I was more attractive to it as time went on, and, of course, Nelson Crow was a great one. I came back when they uh, had the... Uh, uh, the groundbreaking, I guess, out here, and it was supposed to plant trees. Every state, the 17 states, the governor was supposed to arrive and plant the trees. And Nelson Crow and I were in a room up there, and we called and found out the governor wasn't there. And it was the next day we we're going to somebody's going to have to plant a tree. And uh, I said, "Will you call the governor up and tell him to appoint somebody?" So he called him up, and of course, at that time, I was on the state board of forestry in California. And he said, was Bum Gutner there? And, he, and Crow said, yes, well, what the heck? Let him do it. Well, so he said, well, you better talk to him. So I talked to the governor. And I said, all right, you send them a telegram and tell him that you're appointing me, and I will do it, which I did, which was most interesting. That It was cold. A few people were there. You remember that. It was just bitter cold. That wind was blowing that day. And, uh, uh, and after that, I took more interest, and, of course, more interest as time went on. And then finally... Uh, I don't know why, but they called me up and wanted to know whether I would accept a, an appointment as a, on a board of trustees, and I agreed that I would, and I've been coming ever since. As one of the long-time members of the board of trustees, you've seen, of course, the Cowboy Hall of Fame and been a part of helping the Cowboy Hall of Fame grow from its very beginning. Why don't you talk just a little about uh, what you uh, feel has been the... Uh, uh, purpose and accomplishment of the Cabal Hall of Fame. Well, as Claude Olson uh, mentions in his little letter to the Cowboy Hall of Fame, as you probably read, uh, I, th I, th I agree with him. I don't think there's another uh, center or museum in the United States that compares with Cowboy Hall of Fame insofar as the development of the Western uh, area of California and the development of the West and I think it's very important in far, matter of fact as far as history is concerned of the country and fortunately it's been handled by not myself because I'm a latecomer from but those early people Mr. Mitchell and of course naturally uh, Mr. Reynolds who uh, had the dream and unfortunately couldn't live long enough to see the results of his, his hope. And uh, anyway, it has been a great development, and I think as time goes on, more important. The strange thing to me is that people don't know about this, uh, hear about it. We had a meeting, and in, in, uh, they invited me to come up to a meeting because I was the one who brought the name of the late Hugh Baber to the Cowboy Hall of Fame, and he was a nominee. And uh, uh, they had a meeting up in the country that he operated, 
in Northern California, and uh, they, they called me and asked me if I had any suggestions, what might be done there having this big dinner. And I suggested, yeah, sure, we ought to get some of the people from the Cowboy Hall of Fame out there. So I, Fred Dressler came out for me, and uh, uh, Gene Faisal came out and told the story about the Cowboy Hall of Fame, and it was amazing. These people had never heard of it before. And now they're very much interested, and I am sure they're going to support the thing, and they are the kind of people who are interested in history and the development of their country. And uh, I think this is probably true not only of California, but all the other states, too. I'm, I'm sure there are more people in, in Maryland, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Massachusetts, and other eastern states are more interested all the time in this thing because it's part of their history, the development of the West, and I'm, I am sure that uh, 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 Dean Fakel and the, and the trustees are doing a great job in developing this thing. Uh, it's been hard financing the thing, and the people of Oklahoma and Oklahoma City have been particularly uh, good on this thing. They've put up a, a lot of financial help in developing this thing. The development of the West is uh, a unique in world history, I'm sure that uh, you agree. Oh, yes, the, and that's right. I wonder if uh, you might comment here, just kind of personal comments, on uh, uh, what you feel is the importance of the preservation of this particular phase of history, this unique phase of history. What, what importance you think it may play in, in, in for future generations? Well, I... I I, th I think this, that the Cowboy Hall of Fame and Western Heritage Center uh, will give to the young people a better idea on the development of the West than, unfortunately, I think, our uh, movies, our, uh, some of the uh, movies, uh, television, plays and so forth, uh, there are two or three of those that are excellent. There's no question about that. But it doesn't tell the history. It's the same old story about the, the bad man and the good cowboy and the bad cowboy and this type of thing, which doesn't educate the, the, the people at all. They don't have, still have no idea of the production of the land, whether it be cattle, farming, or whatever it may be. Uh, they get no idea of this. It's just another story, and people in Europe enjoy this too, I'm sure. But uh, we need we need more education as far as, the pe as far as the people are concerned as to the production of food. And this is the important thing in the West to produce food for people, whether it be livestock or whether it be uh, fruit or grain or vegetables or flour, whatever it might be. This is the important, most important thing that uh, that we can think of, and without a place like the Cowboy Hall of Fame that will go back far enough and show how it was developed by the, the old timers and the settlers who made the, the trips and put it up to sacrifice to, to develop this, it, I think it's most important. And uh, I, I think it will be supported more and more by, by people who understand what, what it means, the Cowboy Hall of Fame and Western Heritage Center. One effort that's being made by the Cowboy Hall of Fame and is the Western Heritage Awards, the purpose being, of course, to try to develop uh, authenticity and excellence in the preservation of the, her of the heritage in both in movie, television, as well as in books and yes. things. Uh, would you comment on the Western Heritage Awards? You've been to a lot of these, and why don't you comment on the Western Heritage Program? Well, I, I can't really uh, comment very much on, on this, excepting those that have received this award certainly are deserving of it. Uh, it's very difficult to... Uh, these people who have taken part and who have been awarded are people that most people know the names of in the development of, of the attitude of the people uh, they weren't all bad people necessarily at all. They played various parts, that is, the actors themselves played parts in many movies. Most of those movies were good movies. Uh, the writers, of course, there are 
those who are receiving the awards, I am sure, are deserving of those awards because their attitude and their, and their, uh, and their, their the writings on the, on the uh, history and the, and the development of the West, uh, the stories told on this, have been very good. Neil, do you have a question? Well, uh, what I was interested in and you might comment on is was not that the town been coming into San Francisco there. Maybe I'm backtracking here. But, uh, people don't know about how much uh, the, cow the cowboys and cattlemen came into San Francisco on their on their days off, and it was kind of a wide open town in those days. And uh, but they did support the cultural aspects of San Francisco then, didn't they? Oh yes, of course. The years that I was referring to, the years when I was a young father, but and, and when my grandfather came there, of course, it was the early days of San Francisco, and uh, naturally, uh, the uh, the cattle ranchers they were very very large, Miller and Lux, and and many of Southern California, the cattle from San Diego County in Southern California were driven all the way from San Diego to San Diego County to San Francisco, and they were started there in San Francisco. There were no trains, no railroads, nothing in those days, and so they were driven. They changed the, the vaqueros, one lot from Santa, it was in Santa Margarita, for instance. The vaqueros from there would take them as far as Los Angeles. Los Angeles, they'd get some more vaqueros. Those other fellows go back and they take them as far as Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo and so on until they got to San Francisco with them. And then they were purchased up there close to San Francisco out to where we live now by those people in San Francisco handling this. And those were, well, Miller and Lux, my grandfather and a few others up there, I guess, were the ones who did this and developed the meat for the, the uh, sailing vessels. They were coming in there and shipping the meat up, of course, the hauling it up there by by ship up the river, Sacramento River, up to the mines, up toward the mines up there. Did you ever, did you ever meet the uh, Will Rogers? Oh, you did. Tell us about him, as you recall him. As he, uh, well, Will Rogers, of course, was a character, a great character, without question. And, uh, uh, but he enjoyed, he enjoyed the uh, ranch life and vaquero life, uh, how much of that he actually had, I don't know. I don't think it's much. But he did enjoy going to places, and he and the late uh, Boreen, Edward Boreen, uh, would come up when we first started our show in 1929. We'd come up there on a, and see the show on Friday, and then have to get quickly back to Santa Barbara because they're having a show at the same time on Sunday and they would hurry back down there. But uh, they enjoyed coming up. And uh, uh, one thing that Will Rogers became greatly interested in was uh, uh, the roping. And of course, uh, as a stage operator, uh, he was quite a roper, trick roper. Uh, as a cowboy, uh, I don't know how good he was, but he enjoyed it. And he would go up to the what we call the uh, Kim Save Ranch, and uh, in the spring of the year, he and Edward Breen would come up and spend maybe a weekend up there when they were branding their calves, and he enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, uh, not only that, but uh, another interesting thing that I, at least I think is interesting, he came up with Rogers, and, uh, and they came up and they stopped up at what we call the uh, the pun uh, the uh, up by the pun uh, peach, the peach tree ranch that Miller and Lux had at one time and uh, there was a, a characters up there twin brothers that had a, had that place rented uh, no they owned it they had part ownership in the thing and uh, the house burned down and one of these fellows lived in a and what we called a cookhouse in those days on wheels. And uh, it was dark. Will Rogers and this 
man that he was with stopped by there to see Warren Cornwell. And uh, Warren was full of uh, uh, jokes, always playing all the time, too, and as large as was. When they knocked on the door, uh, uh, Warren called out, Who's there? Who's there? And that was when, what was the terrible man? Uh, he's gone. We committed terrible things in California. You're fixing all those black bars? No, <laughs> no, not in those days. Oh, wrong. 30, 40 years ago. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. You can write it okay. down somewhere. Anyway, this, and he said, uh, I'm, uh, Will Rogers answered the man by saying, I am so-and-so, this man that they were looking for all over the state of California, who is a murderer and, I guess, worse. And this fellow back in the in the room there, Warren says, Ah, that's the other man I'm looking for. Open the door. And when Rogers opened the door, he had the gun right on Rogers, pointing the gun at him, knowing full well it wasn't this other fellow at all. But they, uh, this is a great thing. And Will Rogers could tell that story to everybody who went about how this fellow was about to kill him. But uh, everyone out there enjoyed him and liked him very, very much. He was the most... Uh, uh, hospitable sort of a fellow. He enjoyed meeting people. Uh, they didn't necessarily have to be ranch owners, but he just enjoyed knowing people and meeting people and riding with people and talking with people. I've never found anyone who didn't like Will Rogers. The uh, 1929, the show you all were talking about then, was, yes. what, was that your, uh, was this the rodeo? Was this that uh, yes. rodeo? Yes. What, what year did that we, rodeo we, we still start? have this at what we call Bolado Park yeah, now. Joaquin Bolado. Joaquin Bolado had quite a ranch there in the early days there. It's a, it was one of the... the I was told there that uh, Will Rogers could rope five horses in motion. Yes. And he said he rode five of them at once. Yes, he would do that. And the, uh, we had other ropers that could that do that. Mexican done. people could. Really? Oh, yes. But they... they it's, it's a show. It's a show uh, proposition. And they, uh, it, uh, he's done a lot of, he did a lot of that, and he enjoyed it, too. Can you see anything? You had some relative that was an architect. Maybe it was an architect, did you say, out there? My father was my, my father. Yeah, yeah, my father was an architect in did San Francisco. Did he put up any buildings there in San Francisco? Or no, but I don't remember stuff? now. Oh, in those days, uh, yes, he worked for the city architect's office for a young man when my mother and he were first married. And, uh, and then he retired and became an artist, but not an artist to the extent that he ever sold a picture. He never sold anything in his life. He, he just enjoyed doing enjoyed it. it. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, my grandfather on the other side, O'Neill, was a, uh, a cattleman, a butcher, and a cattleman, and my uncles. But uh, this is pretty much the history of the thing, and uh, as far as O'Neill is concerned, if you look in, in uh, John Clay's book, My Life on the Range, you'll, you'll see that, and uh, look in the back pages there, you'll find the name. What about that Camp Pendleton? Did that, did I understand you to say that it took the entire ranch or was there some of it left when they condemned it for the Marine Day? Yes, the, uh, um, the original ranch was made up, was owned by the Fosters and the Fosters were the people who were delivering, of course that's a historical family, the wife of Juan Foster was a uh, uh, sister of the last Mexican governor of California, and he took the ranch when they took the uh, the missions away from the church uh, and uh, turned them over and all the land over to the Indians. And then many of those people at that time bought the land from the Indians with, uh, with actually Mexican money, which did the Indians no good because the Indians couldn't spend that money, no place for them to spend it. And anyway, it took over the ranches, and then later on, uh, because of the change in the laws and other things, why the Forsters uh, wanted to sell the ranch, and so they sold it. My grandfather, Mr. Flood, who was the, uh, the founder, really, of uh, the Nevada Bank, which is now Wells Fargo Bank, 
that's how my grandfather got into the deal because there were all those Irish people in San Francisco were just as close as can be and there were the floods and the O'Neills and the O'Briens and all the rest of them were together and they and, uh, and they made partners in the Murphys uh, and they went down and bought that ranch which were three uh, three uh, Mexican what do you hear? Mexican? No, huh? Mexican? No, the Mexicans uh, clients when they gave the ranch and, and, and Spain gave the ranch oh, land grants land grants Mexican uh, 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 Spanish, uh, Mexican land grants there were three of them there the Mission Vieja the uh, Santa Margarita and the, and the uh, uh, El Trabuco and there was 210,000 acres inside the fence and outside the fence but with building that fence it really put the, the, the fortress in the bad and the United States government did that made him fence these places and my grandfather would pick up everybody that wanted to sell all those fellows on the outside there so that he'd be protected protecting the outside and so when the when the uh, navy took over they took e over everything in, S in san diego county leaving about fifty five thousand acres in in uh, orange county and that's the way it's set up today was, uh, was monterey the capital of california at one time oh yes Monterey was, and and uh, Benicia. Benicia was at one time. That's up there, Columbia, San Francisco Bay. Columbia, I, I think for a short period, short period. and finally Sacramento. Hmm. But uh, great area. That uh, that uh, Monterey area is a, one of the best areas in California as far as uh, your feeds and uh, things concerned. When I say that, I'm talking about everything from We'll say Sonoma from San Francisco Bay down as far as uh, Santa Barbara. They sure grow the fruit, huh? They what? They grow the fruit, don't they? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But up till this year. We had the last week or two, we had uh, a frost there in the mornings that just wiped out the, the, uh, the apricots, the prunes, and the, uh, and the uh, walnuts in our area. Those fellas don't have any thoughts. Probably a billion dollar in that Go on, sure. You told about your parents. I think before we close off, I'd like to know, do you have any children? Yes. Why don't you tell about them? Where well, uh, our, our, we have two children. A son, who was in the Navy for a number of years and retired now, uh, is graduating from law school. And our... Uh, What's his name? His name is uh, John Peter. John called Peter, <laughs> and uh, and our daughter is married to uh, a uh, young attorney in San Francisco, and uh, they both they've been married for almost thirteen years, and they have seven children. What's his name? And Morris. His name is Richard Morris. Her name is uh, uh, Anne Richard Morris. He's an attorney there. He's an attorney there in San Francisco. <laughs> this has been an interview, a very interesting interview, as uh, Mr. John, Bar John Baumgartner, uh, trustee for the National Cowboy Hall of Fame and Western Heritage Center from California. And the date is April 21st, 1972.